In the next few lectures, I want to talk about Robert Nozick's experience machine argument. Um, and I'm going to talk a lot about The Matrix, the movie. Um, I, I pretty clearly think that The Matrix was inspired by Nozick's experience machine. One of the Wachowski siblings was a philosophy major. So they definitely knew about Nozick. I don't think The Matrix is honestly a great movie or even a very good movie. But, you know, it does do a nice job of raising some of these issues. Um, you know, unlike Nozick, it's got guns and, like, very attractive people in tight clothing, whatever, you know. So make a philosophical idea sexy and you'll go far, right? But I do want to talk about this, and even though I think The Matrix is kind of a, at best, mediocre movie, it's entered the public consciousness, and I think in a lot of these ways, you know, it does illustrate these issues pretty well. Um, so first I want to talk about what the experience machine is, and what it's supposed to show, and how relevant this is to the... Um, simulation argument, and indeed to these bigger issues of truth and knowledge we've been looking at. Because I think what's interesting about Nozick is this raises some very interesting questions about the value of truth generally. Okay, so let's talk about the experience machine and what the point of this argument is. So Nozick says, well, imagine this. Imagine that we have invented a machine that can give you whatever sort of experience you want out of life. Um, you know, whatever you dream of, whatever you desire in life, we'll program it into this machine. Then we'll operate on your brain, put electrodes in. The machine will stimulate your brain to think you're getting whatever you want, right? You won't actually be getting it. You'll be laying in a bed with electrodes running into your brain. Or, you know, we could go even further and say maybe they'll cut your brain out and put it in a vat. You know, that's the classic one, right? But either way, you won't actually be doing any of the stuff you think you're doing, right? If you want to get into politics, you might be imagining that you are elected president. If you want to have a career in entertainment, you know, you might think you're winning a Grammy or an Oscar, adored by millions. None of that will be happening. You'll just be laying in this bed with a feeding tube down your throat, with, you know, all the bad stuff that happens to people who are immobilized for long periods of time will be happening to you. Or you'll just be a brain in a vat, no body, right? And, and now look, students get hung up on this and they say, well, how do we know we could trust it? What if, you know, what if the machine doesn't work? You know, you know, the way this is sketched, you know, this guy sounds like a mad scientist who trusts mad scientists, right? Um, put all that aside, though. I, you know, I think that kind of misses the point that Nozick is trying to make. Imagine that the machine is completely reliable. You know, this guy shows you people who've been hooked up for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, you know, or all his many brains and vats that have been there forever, right? The machine is perfectly reliable. You don't have any risk of mishap or any, you know, any more risk of a mishap or accident than you would in ordinary life. Even if, so suppose the simulation is perfect, there's no risk. Suppose, too, that somehow they'll make you forget you're even in the experience machine. You know, you forget it. It's just from that day forward, your life just somehow goes incredibly so much better. You start getting everything you want. And bad things no longer happen to you, or at least very few bad things, right? Maybe you need a few bad things to appreciate the good, but, you know much rarer than they are now, right? You know, in real life, really bad things can and unfortunately do in some respect happen to most of us in the experience machine. Well, you know, 
Maybe you'll drop your toast and it lands jam side down, but the bigger bad things won't happen to you, right? And you'll have the experience of getting all the good stuff you want out of life. You won't really get any of it, you know. Like I said, you won't be a rock star or a Hollywood star or president or the first man to go to Mars or the first woman to go to Jupiter, any of that. But you'll think you do, right? Well, the question then is, would you hook yourself up? And Nozick thinks that most of us would not. Now, now, you know, occasionally I have students who are like, heck yeah, hook me up to the machine. And I'm a little bit, you know, I'm a little bit, you know, I'm not sure what to make of that. I half suspect that they don't mean it and they're just trying to irritate me, which is something students do with their professors. It's something I've done with professors, other authority figures, right? It's the thing people do, right? Um, I don't know. I hope that's the truth because it'd be a little sad if they are serious. Maybe they are serious, right? But I'm going to guess that even if some people might choose to be hooked up, most people would not. Most of you, I am going to guess, would say no to the experience machine. And not only would you say no to it, I have the reaction, and I'm going to guess that most of you do too, that people who are hooked up to the experience machine are in some sense unfortunate. I look out at this sea of beds with people who've been in the experience machine forever or this, you know, row upon row of brains and jars and I think this person has suffered something bad happening to them even if they don't know it. In fact, the fact they don't know it almost makes it worse, right? That they are so thoroughly and completely deluded and will be from the beginning of their life, or the beginning of going to the experience machine all the way to the end of their life, right? All right. And if you think that, you know, if you legitimately don't think that, then, well, you know, the argument just doesn't work for you. But I think most people do have that thought. I wouldn't let myself be hooked up. And in a sense, it's bad for the people who are hooked up. You know, even if they made the choice, you might pity them in the way that you pity an addict, right? They have chosen to do it. It's still, in some sense, bad for them. I think a lot of us have that reaction. Okay, so from the science fiction possibility, knows it gives us something like the following argument. If all we cared about was experience, we would think the life in the experience machine is the best possible life for a person. If people in the experience machine had the best possible life, we would choose to be hooked up to the machine. Or, at the very least, we would envy the people who are hooked up, right? You know, maybe we wouldn't hook ourselves up. We might think, okay, well, you know, I have duties. I don't want to abandon my family. You know, I can't just quit my job and leave them in the lurch or whatever. You know, so we might think we have a duty to others to not hook ourselves up to the machine. But we would think even if we chose not to, it would be a sacrifice, right? It would be good for us, and we should envy the people in the machine if, in fact, it's true that experience is all that matters. Three, we would not choose to be hooked up, and we would not envy the people who are. Right? We, personally would not choose to be hooked up to the machine, or at least I wouldn't, and I'm guessing a lot of you wouldn't either, and you wouldn't think that the people who are are lucky and you should envy them. In fact, most of us would pity those people, right? They think great things are happening, but they're just a brain in a vat or someone in a bed, you know, 
with all the health problems that come with being just completely sedentary all the time. So this is an argument that uses modus tollens and it just kind of zips back, right? You know, if all we cared about was experience, then life in the experience machine, best possible life for a person. If life in the experience machine, best possible life for a person, we should either hook ourselves up or at least envy the people who are. We don't envy them. We wouldn't hook ourselves up. So we have to reject two. And if we reject two, since two is just a consequence of one, we also have to reject one. This gets us the conclusion of the argument, so we care about more than experience. Well, now this raises a question. So far, this argument is just a negative one, right? Experience is not the only thing we care about. Well, the question then is, what is the other thing we care about, or the other things we care about, maybe? And, you know, why don't we get those in the experience machine? Basically, what is it we would be missing in the experience machine? What is bad about life in the experience machine? And the most obvious explanation, the most natural explanation of what is bad about life in the experience machine is that the person in the experience machine is thoroughly and completely wrong about everything, right? They think that they live in a huge mansion. In fact, they live in a bed, right? Or in a vat, you know, depending on how we imagine it. They think that they are the first person to set foot on Mars, planting the flag on Mars. In fact, they're just laying in a bed being fed or not even a body. They're just a brain in the vat, right? They, perhaps even worse than all that, you know, they think that they have an incredibly attractive, attentive spouse who deeply cares about and loves them. That person doesn't even exist, right? Or if it is somebody that actually exists, that they've dreamed about, the spouse isn't that person, right? In fact, no one loves and cares about them in that way because, you know, the loving spouse is just a computer simulation. You know, the spouse, as a few lines of code, doesn't care about them any more than the computer that I'm recording these lectures into cares about me, right? They might think that they are the president, loved and adored at least by the people who voted for them. All those people they think love and adore them don't exist, right? They might think as the president they're finally bringing peace to the Middle East or toppling Vladimir Putin from power and bringing democracy to Russia. They're doing no such thing, right? No more than a kid who's playing a video game is actually conquering the world. None of this is happening. They are completely deluded. And what this seems to show is that truth has intrinsic value. What, what does this mean when I say that truth has intrinsic value? Or at the very least, we might say believing or knowing the truth has intrinsic value. So, philosophers, I think important to see here that philosophers often distinguish between intrinsic versus instrumental value. If something is instrumentally valuable, it's valuable only as a means to something else. Well, I think examples always help. So let me give you an example. Let's take dieting, right? Why would people go on a diet? You go on a diet, if you're me, maybe because your doctor lectures you, your blood pressure is too high, you have these other problems, you need to lose some weight, right? You need to lose some weight, don't eat so much fat. You know, already causing you some problems. You're going to have more if you keep doing this. 
change your diet, right? And then they give you a little brochure, the DASH diet. So if I go on a diet, why would I do that? Well, partially to avoid a lecture from my doctor, but more importantly, to avoid all these health problems she keeps warning me about, right? Or maybe you go on a diet because it's another problem for me. Maybe you have some clothes you really like you can't fit into anymore, right? I have this jacket that I think is great. It, I'm not fitting into that thing, right? It's like that Chris Farley sketch, you know, it's, it's just not fun, right? So if I go on a diet, then, you know, my reasons might be improving my health, avoiding lectures from my doctor, fitting into clothes I can't fit into anymore, right? The diet, though, is just a means. It's just a way to get this other stuff I care about. No one would ever say that being on a diet is valuable in and of itself, right? It has value, if it does, only as a means to other stuff you care about. Mm -hmm. Notice, it makes perfect sense to ask somebody why they went on a diet, right? You will think that they will tell you about this other stuff that it makes sense to care about as a means to that, right? Intrinsic value is different. Something that has intrinsic value just is valuable in and of itself. Probably the best and easiest example of something that has intrinsic value is pleasure, right? Pleasure in all its various forms, right? You know, you know, think of this, right? I've been playing a lot of chess, right, since the pandemic started. And you might ask me, well, why do you play chess, right? That's a perfectly sensible question. And if I said to you, it's like, well, chess is fun. At least I have fun with it, and it helps me avoid boredom, right? It would be a really weird, in fact, almost stupid question Maybe it'd be a question a philosopher would ask, but, but probably it would be a stupid question if you said, well, well, why do you want to have fun? Why do you want to have fun? Why do you want to avoid boredom, right? Fun is just a good thing, right? Fun is another word for a pleasure or a type of pleasure, right? Pleasure is intrinsically valuable. You don't have fun as a means to something else, Fun just is valuable, right? You don't try to avoid boredom as a means to something else. Avoiding boredom is valuable, right? You might also say some things have intrinsic disvalue, right? Pain in its various instances is a thing people tend to think has intrinsic disvalue, right? Boredom is a form of pain, sort of a psychic pain. It's unpleasant. Boredom has intrinsic disvalue. Avoiding boredom is a good thing, right? Well, so what's my point with all this? So look, now, now this isn't either or. A thing can have both intrinsic value and instrumental value, right? Having fun generally might be one of those things it does, right? Probably, if you, you know, feel pleasure, it's good in itself. It's also going to, like, probably have good effects on your health, right? People who are generally happy tend to be healthier. Pleasure, fun, avoiding boredom, these things, they have intrinsic value. They also probably have instrumental value. They're good in themselves. They're good as means to other things, too. Well, now the question is, does truth have only instrumental value or is it one of those things that has intrinsic and instrumental value? Now, obviously, knowing truth has instrumental value, right? If you don't know the truth, it will set you up for a lot of bad things, right? And knowing the truth might and often is very helpful. 
at getting you other things you want. Right. If you say believe that you have a system where you can game the stock market, you have a false belief that's just not possible. It's, economics doesn't work that way. If there were a system where people could game it, everybody would try to do it, then that would be built into the price of the stock. It's just, you just can't do it, right? I had a student who thought he had a system, and, and I just, you know, when he told me about this, I liked the guy. I just, if you guys have ever watched Bob's Burgers, I kind of made that noise Tina does when she's anxious, like, uh, right? It's instrumentally bad for this guy that he believes this false thing, that he has a system to game the stock market. It's also instrumentally bad for him that he doesn't know some truths about economics. It would be instrumentally good for him to know those truths about why you can't game the stock market with a system, right? You know, um, plenty of other truths might be instrumentally valuable. Um, you know, in the great state of Virginia, this knowledge often comes in useful when you have the inspection, right? I mean, I'm, I'm not a great mechanic, but I know enough, you know, when I take the car in for an inspection or my wife does, I know enough generally when they're trying to scam me, right? Um, you know, remember the pet boys in Virginia Beach, you know, they find all this stuff wrong with my wife's car. And I'm like, this is, this is nonsense. And what's more, we can do this ourselves, right? Calling them on their scam saves us a few hundred dollars. Saving money is good. You can use money for other stuff. Obviously, knowing some stuff about cars is instrumentally value, valuable. Plenty of other knowledge is instrumentally valuable, right? But now the question is, does it have intrinsic value? Is it good over and above the other things it helps you get or avoid? Well, Nozick thinks the experience machine shows that it is, right? If you would not plug yourself into the machine or think that doing so would be bad in some way, Nozick thinks you have to believe that truth, believing the truth, avoiding believing falsehoods, has some intrinsic value. Because look, by not plugging yourself into the machine, you are giving up something that all of us thinks has intrinsic value. You are giving up some pleasure, right? You know, look, your day-to-day -day life, our normal lives, hopefully will be pretty pleasant. We'll get a lot of the stuff we want, but they won't be as good as this, like, amazing experience machine life, right? We are giving up some pleasure to not hook ourselves into the machine. And we're probably setting ourselves up for some pain, right? Real life will have more frustrations, you know, and bad things than life in the experience machine. So how in the world, if we didn't think that knowing the truth is intrinsically valuable and avoiding being deceived is intrinsically valuable, how, if we didn't think that, could we justify giving up something that we all admit is intrinsically valuable, some pleasure to not hook ourselves up. So, that is what Nozick thinks the experience machine shows. And, and I tend to agree with Nozick. I would not hook myself up, at least not in the way my current life is going. We'll, we'll talk about sometimes maybe Unfortunately for some people, it would make sense. That seems to be something Nozick neglects. We'll come back to that. But at least in my current life, I wouldn't hook myself up, right? And I would pity people who are hooked up to the experience machine. Well, if you guys are thinking a bit, you can probably see how this all comes back to the simulation argument, right? How it's relevant isn't or wouldn't life in a simulation be bad in exactly the same way as the experience machine, right? The experience machine just is a type of simulation. 
So, if our reality is a computer simulation, wouldn't that be bad for us in the same way that life in the experience machine is bad? We are deluded. And wouldn't it be good for us to know the truth? We are deceived if we are in a, in a simulation. We are deceived so we miss the value of knowing truth. And if we are in a simulation, we believe falsehoods, which does seem, you know, we believe we're in the real world, not a simulation. We think there's stuff out there, not just lines of code. Well, that seems to have intrinsic disvalue believing false stuff in the same way that pain does. It just is bad for us. If all that's true, shouldn't the possibility that we are in a simulation bother us? And not just bother us, but bother us really deeply. And shouldn't we want to find out, right? If we have a chance to find out whether we're in a simulation or not, if we are in a simulation, you know, the truth of our reality might not be a happy one, but we would at least know it. We would no longer know, believe all these falsehoods. Wouldn't that be good for us to know the truth, avoid falsehood? If we're not in a simulation, wouldn't it be great for us to know for certain? But if we are, even if it's kind of a lousy thing to know, wouldn't that be valuable even if it might make us unhappy or have other bad consequences? Um, if you guys have ever watched The Matrix, and again, if you haven't, you know, if, if, if you're bored on a Thursday night and have nothing better to do, well, you, you know, The Matrix isn't a bad, it's, out of four stars, it's, it's the picture of a two and a half star movie. You know, then if you haven't seen it and you're bored and, you know, you can think of nothing better, watch The Matrix. Honestly, if, if it were me, I'd rather watch an actually good movie <laughs> again, you know, in, um, Inception or Arrival or even just a stupid movie that's a lot more fun than The Matrix like Step Brothers, but there's worse movies, right? Anyway, back to my actual point. In The Matrix, you know, there's this scene, um, which unfortunately has been taken over as a metaphor by a lot of Nazis, but whatever, The Matrix is not guilty for what Nazis have done with it. But, you know, there's this scene where one of the characters offers the main character a choice. You can either go and remain deluded about reality. If you want to do that, take this blue pill. You'll forget I ever even offered you the choice. But if you want to know the truth, take the red pill, right? And now the movie, we're supposed to think, oh, you know, the hero takes the, the, the red pill. I mean, if there wasn't, there wouldn't be a movie, right? That would, that would actually be, I think, kind of funny. You know, oh, no, I'll take the blue pill into the movie. Neo wakes up in his bed. Credits roll, right? Um, not only does he take the red pill, we are supposed to see this as the heroic choice, right? It would be bad, it would be pathetic if he were to take the blue pill because even though the reality he comes out into, basically post-apocalyptic hellscape with killer machines, it's unpleasant, but it's better for him to know the truth, right? And there's another character in The Matrix who wants to go back in and we're supposed to think, oh, he's pathetic, he's a villain because... He can't handle the truth. He wants to go back in there, right? So these are all the intuitions that Nozick's, you know, intuitions we just mean reactions, that we have to Nozick's experience machine. It would pretty clearly seem to show simulation bad. We should want to know the truth about whether we are in a simulation and it should be important to us. Let's dig a little more deeply into that in the next lecture. Um, and just, just to lay my cards on the table to you guys, um, one of the reasons I think The Matrix is a bad movie, 
not I didn't say bad. One of the reasons I think The Matrix is a thoroughly mediocre movie is for me at least, I think there's a lot to be said for taking the blue pill. Um, I actually think that's the right choice. Anyway, um, I'll explain why that is the next few lectures. It doesn't mean you guys necessarily have to think that's the right choice either, but I think there's a lot to be said for it. That might set up kind of a mystery to you. Well, how can he say that Nozick's right and that truth has value but also it's stupid to, you know, not take the blue pill in the Matrix scenario. Well, I'll explain in the next few lectures. Again, you don't have to agree with me. I do just think it's interesting to make the case.